I've always felt that America, that my relation to America is analogous to a marriage. You know, I love this country. I hate it. I get angry at it. I feel close to it. I, I'm charmed by it. I'm repelled by it. And it's a marriage that's gone on, let's say, for at least the 50 years of my writing life. And in the course of that, what's happened? The marriage has gotten worse. It's not what it used to be. Now, this is my spiritual wife, if you will, my country. And I've lost respect for it. It's just like losing respect in a marriage. If you're married for 40, 50 years, and you start to lose respect for your mate, it's, it's tragic. It's sad. I wouldn't say it's tragic in my case, it's sad. And I sit there in, in a certain unhappiness in relation to my country. It has not become as, as, as great and as noble as I wanted it to become. The shits are killing us, even as they kill themselves. Each day, a few more lies eaten to the seed with which we are born, little institutional lies from the print of newspapers, the shock waves of television, and the sentimental cheats of the movie screen. We have grown up in a world more in decay than the worst of the Roman Empire. We want the heats of the orgy and not its murder, the warmth of pleasure without the grip of pain, and therefore the future threatens a nightmare and we continue to waste ourselves. The evil mastermind of aggression is forced into the open. The world's number one arsonist and killer declares the war on the United States and his stooges applaud. Going into the army, I had no question in my mind of what I wanted to get from the army and from the war, which was I was a young novelist I had written two novels already, they were terrible, but, but I didn't know how terrible they were at that point. And I thought, well, maybe I have some real talent. I want to write a novel about the Second World War, and I want to be the great novel about the Second World War. And I was dying to go to Europe. Uh, my feeling was I want to be uh, in the first wave of the invasion troops. And when I went to the South Pacific, I was depressed by that. That was the wrong war as far as I was concerned. I wanted to be uh, uh, in Europe. I thought that was where the great novel was to be written. Our Joint Chiefs of Staff had chosen an inconspicuous island with a name most Americans had never heard, Leyte. America was ready to fulfill her promise, return to the Philippines. I think what surprised me most was how um, cool I felt. Uh, there's a detachment that you need as a writer. And as a young man, I probably had more detachment than I have today. So that part of me was just uh, looking at this battlefield, and it was certainly full of horrors. I probably was feeling less horror than uh, the uh, others. I thought, oh, this is so good. Not, not that it was good that all these people were dead, but oh, it's so good for uh, writing one will be able to write about this. When I was corresponding with my wife, I used to put a great many descriptions of combat and patrols and scenes like this into my letters because one couldn't take the chance of keeping notes with one. It was, you know, too imperfect. You never knew when you'd have to leave the notes behind, when they'd get wet, when they'd be lost. So I used to write to her. Right before us was a destroyed Japanese armored half-track and a tank. The vehicles were still smoldering, and the driver of the half-track had half fallen out. His head, which was crushed from one ear to his jaw, lay reclining on the running board, and his pitiful other leg lay near his head on the ground, and a little smoke was still arising from his chest. The Naked and the Dead came out, and it had uh, a huge success, which I was not ready for. I was a young man, I was 25, I probably, the irony is, although there's, looking back on it now, there's a good deal of uh, uh, maturity in the naked and the dead and understanding of people, it was a most intense and limited kind of maturity. It consisted of people I knew in the army, and I knew them well, and I've been one of them. So I, I was writing from the inside out, and there was, a, there was a kind of understanding there that was way ahead of my years, but the rest of me was not particularly sophisticated. I, I was relatively a simple fellow. Uh, uh, compared to the sophistication you would expect in a, in a young novelist who'd written, uh, you know, that, that successful book. And the success of it took away my, uh, my former identity. I suddenly had moved from being someone who uh, 
was very modest and, and had a small sense of myself, other than that I th hoped and believed I might be talented, into someone who was a figure in American life. Life magazine is putting me on its pages among 50 uh, famous repscallions, you, you, you see, uh, so forth. So I wasn't I'm not at all prepared for it. I was not at all equipped for it. It was very difficult those years. <laughs> I would go so far as to say that America suffered after the Second World War. America suffered from a collective shift of identity, and uh, everyone felt uncomfortable. The Cold War filled that discomfort perfectly, beautifully, from the point of view of the establishment, because it gave us an enemy again. And um, Americans function best. We're team players to an extraordinary extent. Probably comes out of having to have settled the West and at being able to function in, in communities. And so if you're a team player, you have to have an opponent. Otherwise, uh, there's nothing more uh, onerous than practicing on a team that plays no games. And so the big game became the Cold War. The growing menace of communism arouses the House of Representatives Un-American Activities Committee. Their goal is the overthrow of our government. Communism in reality is not a political party. It is a way of life, an evil and malignant way of life. It reveals a condition akin to disease that spreads like an epidemic. And like an epidemic, a quarantine is necessary to keep it from infecting this nation. There were many people here right after the war and in the early 50s who would have loved to go to war with the Soviet Union. They knew they were weak at that point, and they wanted to take them before they get their strength. That was the attitude. So, you know, uh, how can we not be paranoid when there's fear of a, uh, a, a nuclear holocaust? Attention, all those who are in the streets. Run for the nearest shelter, but run as close to the walls of buildings as possible. Get out of that car. It's dangerous. But now, suppose the enemy succeeded in sneaking past our warning system. Although this is highly improbable, let's assume that the bomb was delivered without our being alerted. There'll be an intense flash of light, and when you see that light, forget all about shelters and preparation. Just don't look at that light. Cover your eyes with your elbows like this, and then dive for cover. You have just three seconds. just seen is the worst that could happen. But remembering this might someday save your life. And the Cold War was on and with the Cold War had come an absolute constriction on the nature of morals, the freedom of sexual morals. Everybody was very proper. It was a time of when, I, when everyone spoke of the family and togetherness. I for president, I for president, I for president, I for president. You like I, I like I. Everybody likes I for president. Hang out the banner, beam the drum. We'll take I to Washington. We don't want John or D or Harry. Let's do that big job right. Just get in step with the guy that's hip. Get in step with I. You like I, I like I. Everybody likes I for president. Hang out the banner. The drum. We'll take I to Washington. We'll take I to Washington. The 50s started in 1952 with Eisenhower. And he was much beloved. The two presidents have probably been loved the most in uh, my lifetime since Franklin Delano Roosevelt. It been Eisenhower and Reagan. Age and experience join with youth to make a team that sends Republican hope soaring in the campaign of 1952. We're going to have a united front this November that's going to assure the victory for General Eisenhower that the country needs. Victory for the party and what is more important for the country, my boy. <laughs> Eisenhower was, was a wasp. Eisenhower was a man who represented regularity, <coughs> security, calm, lack of imagination. What he suggested to the country was, if you're not too imaginative, you'll do better than if you are imaginative. This is what came off him. This is how people reacted. People in America always identify with the president. It's quite different from Europe, where most people wouldn't for a moment think of themselves as being like the president. Here, our president is the equivalent of, of royalty for us. Oh. 
We, of course, on the left did not think too much of Eisenhower. Looking back on him, I, I think maybe America was lucky to have had him, because if we'd had someone who was a little bit more like Joe McCarthy, we really could have gone in very bad directions. Eisenhower kept the balance in the country. But it was a time, looking back on it, it was also a time when the corp American corporation began to take those huge strides toward controlling America. I mean, by now, in the 1990s, the corporation runs America. You don't have to worry about Bill Clinton. He runs nothing. The corporation runs America. And in the 50s is when they began to develop their immense power. What happened is that the corporation very slowly and subtly over these decades has been giving people the idea that the corporation is the place to be, that you're lucky working for a corporation, that they take care of you. None of this is true. But they have succeeded in brainwashing America at, at this day, now in the present. And it began in the 50s. The idea that the corporation was the place to be, that you lived a good life if you worked for the corporation, you lived a clean life. Um, it was a great encouragement to mediocrity. You see, if, if you were a loyal but mediocre person, you could thrive in the corporation. It was like a benign version of Sovietism, if you will. Trouble, Judy? Can I help? It's the mixture. It just won't work. Well, let me take a look. <laughs> there we are. Mark slipped out. That's all. How do you suppose that happened? Just one of those things. First thing you do when an appliance doesn't work is find out if it's plugged in. Golly, I'm so impressed. At the expression of surprise on her face, he began to laugh. Don't you worry, sweetie, he said. And down he looked at that frightened female mouth, facsimile of all those smiling lips he had seen, so ready to serve at the thumb of power. And with a cough, he started to talk. That's a good girly, that's a good girly, that's a good girly, he said in a mild little voice. You're an angel, darling, and I like you. You're my darling, darling. I must have touched a button because that passage at the time was written kicked off the most extraordinary business. The man who had published The Naked and the Dead, uh, and after all had made a good deal of money on it, and presumably had a, a hot young novelist that he could use for years, refused to publish the book with that passage and I had to withdraw the book from him and then six other publishers wouldn't take it. I went through six publishers before uh, someone was willing to take it and the man who was willing to take it hardly even read the passage he just said ah I just figured that uh, if you'd done well once maybe this was a bum book but if you'd done well once you'd do well again so I decided to take you. I hardly even read your book before I decided to take it. The other six were all in a panic over it. It gives a notion of the extraordinary purience and, and conservatism of that period in American life. This is about 1955. So that was what turned me around, in effect. In 1955, when the Deer Park came out, was the period when I turned around, I suddenly realized, I've been talking like a radical all these years, but I haven't really felt like a radical. I really felt as if I was part of them. I'm part of the publishers. I'm part of the whole uh, literary establishment. And I'm not. And it finally, when push comes to shove, they're willing to, to get rid of me. And I, I was in a deep rage. It, I came in contact for the first time in my life with the depth of my own rage. And it was large. The outlaw was in me. There was an outlaw in me that was screaming to get out. All right, this was the excuse, if you will. Uh, there was a part of me that did not want to uh, belong to the team. The team, as far as I was concerned, never took any chances. And there was a side of myself that had been growing wilder every year that wanted to uh, be out there. About that time, I connected with marijuana, and I was off for a ride. It was as if I hadn't experienced anything new in a few years, and now I was young again and feeling a great deal. I was only 30 at the time. In sitting down to write a sermon for this collection, I find arrogance in much of my mood. It cannot be helped. The sour truth is that I am imprisoned with a perception 
which will settle for nothing less than making a revolution in the consciousness of our time. I still feel that the world is um, going into a dreariness and a mediocrity it does not need to go into. Now, there are all sorts of wonderful things happening all the time. We're human beings, after all, and we're creative people. And so a great deal happens that's good and beautiful and fine and noble and extraordinary and expressive. But at the same time, um, there's a um, triumph of the mediocre. Who I refer again to my old pal, Plastic. <laughs> What's it to you? Children grow up sucking on this stuff. Think of it, they, they finger it. There, there's nothing, you, your fingertips feel nothing. If you touch a glass, you feel a little bit. You touch wood, you feel quite a bit. But when you touch this, nothing comes back. And you've had now for four decades, more and more and more infants and children live with this stuff and play with it. And you cannot possibly feel any affection for it. I mean, after all, what is plastic when you stop to think about it? Plastic is uh, the excrement of oil. That's how it started. What happened is all these people who were making their billions, their early billions on oil, were throwing away the waste product of oil when they refined the, the oil. And then suddenly somebody said, well, look, we're throwing away a fortune. In the French sense, we are piecing away a fortune. Let us save the waste product of oil. And so now we are surrounded by the excrement of oil. Nobody's ever been nourished by plastic. It's functional. It's the spiritual equivalent of political correctness. It's functional. It serves a purpose. And the cost of serving this purpose is enormous. One's teeth, when they're repaired, are now filled with plastic. Once upon a time, you had mercury in there. You had gold. You had silver. You had various metals. You could have a certain companionship with the devil. You know, mercury gave you, uh, God knows what, it poisoned you on the one hand, and on the other hand, it put you in contact with occult forces. Now what do you have in your teeth? Plastic. Your mouth feels numb. You kiss less well. We had a club, and we used to go there and box. And so I loved the boxing while I was doing it, because it... Um, it, it gave me a sense of so many things, including my own physical position in the world. It was a matter of uh, taking on uh, risks that I had been afraid of before. And so, you know, I started getting into a few fights that I would not normally have gotten into, that sort of thing, and uh, I don't regret it. If it hadn't come out that way, uh, if uh, there hadn't been this search for a greater machismo in myself, that I probably would have ended up uh, uh, a victim of cancer. Certainly my writing in that period is just obsessed with cancer, that everything in the scheme of things is seeking to give us cancer. Because after all, what is cancer but the revolt of the cells, the, the statement of the body, that uh, some of the cells in the body refuse to obey the hegemony of the body. They, they revolt. They are off on their own. Their, their attitude is, you body, you can take care of yourself now. I'm a rebel. I'm a radical. I'm going to destroy you. And I think one of the reasons we have this huge amount of violence now in America is because we're such a plastic country. To get back to some kind of real instinctive feeling, people tend to get more and more violent. It is uh, the one act I can look back on and uh, regret for the rest of my life. And it happened. It happened out of the way I was living. There's no question about that. It, it came. It, I didn't stab her because of my ideas. Uh, what happened is I was getting into more and more of a violent edge, and it, it happened. If, if you live in a way where you can't feel your senses, then you have to go in for more and more extraordinary uh, uh, actions, and, and violence is one of them. First films of Cuban rebel leader Fidel Castro and his ragged force in their mountain stronghold. We live in a country very different from Cuba. We have had a tyranny here, but it did not have the features of Batista. By law, we had a free press. Almost no one spoke his thoughts. By custom, we had a free ballot. Was there ever a choice? We were a league of silent, defeated men who could not even assent on which were the true battles we lost. This is from an open letter to Fidel Castro that was written in 1960 and came out in 1961. In silence, we gave you our support. You were aiding us. 
You were giving us psychic ammunition. You were aiding us in that desperate, silent struggle we have been fighting with sick, dead hearts against the cold, insidious cancer of the power that governs us. You were giving us new blood to fight our mass communications, our police, our secret police, our corporations, our empty politicians, our clergymen, our editors, our cold, frightened, bewildered bullies who govern a machine made out of people they no longer understand. You were giving us hope they would not always win. What I felt about Kennedy was not that his politics were anything that remarkable. He was a conventional Democrat, a middle-of-the-road Democrat. He was a Cold War warrior. Uh, but he was a young man. He was very good-looking. He had a wife who was extraordinarily beautiful, certainly beautiful enough to be a movie star. And I knew enough about America by then, at least in my own mind, to think that whoever the president was created the prevailing mood in the country. <laughs> There's a dream life in America, and I felt that Kennedy and Mrs. Kennedy were closer to that dream life than Richard Nixon would be. What it meant to me was that, precisely because of their youth and their good looks, they were going to encourage, willy-nilly, whether they chose to or not, an opening in America, a return to the sense of oneself as a human animal who lived in a field of senses. And I was looking for change. I felt the change, you kind of control change. It'll go in all sorts of directions I don't foresee, but that's better than the status quo we're living in. Now, whether I was right or wrong, I could argue over with myself for, for many years, because Kennedy did make a lot of changes when he came in, not through politics, through his presence. The assault has begun on the dictatorship of Fidel Castro. Cuban army pilots open the first phase of organized revolt with bombing raids on three military bases. Two of the B-26 light bombers then seek asylum in Florida. On the heels of the air raids, landings were effected by rebels at several places on the Cuban coast. I never saw Kennedy as, as a politician that I was in agreement with. I saw him as an active agent, as a catalyst, if you will, that would accelerate a great many trends in American life. I was totally opposed uh, to, to, his, to his going along with the Bay of Pigs. I, I was scorching what I had to write at, at that time about Kennedy. I felt betrayed, <coughs> but not surprised. years when I wanted to be an advisor to uh, any number of powerful people. I felt that, you know, I, I might have a certain talent for it. Looking back on it, it was a folly. No, no powerful person would ever have come near me. I mean, what kind of advice could I give them? Uh, destroy what you've accomplished already. Take up new ideas. Disregard your past. Become a new person. I mean, it's absurd when I look back on it. Uh, I have to laugh at, 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 at the folly involved, at the seriousness, the romantic seriousness of what I felt was possible with powerful people. You know, what I know by now is that when a man achieves great power, he's become a machine. You know, if 2% if of them remains human, that means he's a pretty good, powerful person. Most of them have about one-tenth of one percent. Here is a book of presidential papers about all the topics a president ought to consider and rarely does, and some of the topics he considers every day, but rarely in a fashion which is fresh. Here are some of these topics. Capital punishment, censorship, drug addiction, juvenile delinquency, America's need for a hero as chief, political conventions, the CIA, Castro, the Negro emergence, fallout shelters, the first lady as a television entertainer, the first lady as a hostage, witchcraft, revolution, cannibalism, architecture, and totalitarianism. Ambitious young men ready to become president in 20 or 30 years will do worse than to read my book. 
for its studies are appropriate to the education of a commander-in-chief. So submits this devil. Mrs. Kennedy is making one of her first public appearances in several months. Traveling with the presidential party are Vice President and Mrs. Johnson and Texas Governor John Connolly. The country was founded on violence. The people who left from other countries to come to America were, uh, were, were enforced immigrants in a way. They left because they weren't wanted in their country. So they were angry people to begin with. And then we had uh, blacks coming here who, was, who had been taken from their own country and enslaved and sent over in slave ships and worked as slaves for generation after generation. So given all that, the, uh, it was very, you know, it's not that we're a violent country. It would be amazing if we weren't violent. The roots are violent. From Dallas, Texas, the flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, some 38 minutes ago. It, it, it did America a damage from which we still haven't, uh, you know, recovered. It was terrible because what it did is it gave uh, all Americans, good Christian Americans suddenly were beginning to think like Jews, which is the Jews, in my opinion, have a catastrophic view of history, which is you try everything, you do everything, you work hard, and then boom, something happens that destroys whole hordes of, of your own race. Oswald did that to America. Oswald gave America the sense that terrible things can happen for no reason at all. And this catastrophic view of history is very close to an absurdist view of history, which is that nothing means anything. And that's very, very bad for the health of a society. He's been shot. He's been shot. Hey, Oswald has been shot. The key thing about Oswald that, that is his odd relation to America is he's a very special kind of American. If, if uh, an American tragedy had not been the title of one of Dreiser's great books, I would have called this book an American tragedy because Oswald was, was a consummate loner. Nobody ever saw him as, as a human being. They saw him either as a patsy, as a victim, or they think of him as just this sort of mean, hideous little creature who killed a great president. He didn't see it that way. He saw himself as a genius. It was extraordinary, it was incredible. And then on top of that, he had the unique experience of um, being, in, being in a low station in the Soviet Union and in America. And what he knew was that both countries were huge and phony and that their propaganda had nothing to do with their reality. Life at the bottom in America was most unpleasant. Life at the bottom or the near bottom in Russia was most unpleasant. The two of them were going to destroy each other if they didn't watch out. And he knew better. He knew how to save the world if only people would listen to him. This was the, the sort of immense intensity in him. And that, there are so many Americans who are like that. Lyndon Johnson had been um, a figure of fun for many of us during the uh, early 60s because uh, the Kennedys and their entourage did not really respect him. Uh, so we didn't take him too seriously. Well, when he came in, we immediately began to change our mind because he came in in a real uh, whirlwind of energy and decided he wanted to create the great society. He wanted to go down in history. He wanted to wipe out a Kennedy's memory. Uh, he was jealous of the affection people had felt for Kennedy and for Camelot. He was a, Johnson was anything but Camelot. And Johnson set out to build the Great Society, and for a, for a year or two, everybody was very excited. It looked like blacks were going to get civil rights. Uh, there was going to be a, a certain leveling of the income across the board. People who were poor were going to be taken care of. We were going to become a decent nation. Uh, you know, it really was pretty exciting for a short period. I never believed in it, mainly because I didn't like his face. You know, I was that visceral, if you will. Uh, uh, I, my feeling was if I don't like somebody's face, I probably don't like what they're up to. So 
one could have put up with that. One could have said, all right, he's pompous and he's a fraud and he's a phony, but he's building the nearest thing we've had to a great society. And then he got the idea that uh, he needed a war. He needed that little old war in Vietnam, because that would get all the patriots going, get the right wing going, he could unify the country. And I think very cynically he did all these things. And then when he got into Vietnam, his trouble was he went into Asia to fight communism, to fight the alien ideology, and I don't think he'd ever read two pages of Marx. Now, if he'd read a thousand pages of Marx, he still would have done it, perhaps, but he would have had a better understanding of what was involved and the passions of the people he was facing. And so he led us into Vietnam, and it became a disaster. American people like when we get in a contest of any kind, whether it's in a, a war or an election or in a football game or what it is, they want it decided and decided quickly and uh, get in or get out and they like for that curve to rise like this and they like for the opposition to go down like this. Now that, that's not the kind of war we're fighting in Vietnam. Bringing the fight to an enemy who strikes in the night against helpless hamlets and villages in ruthless tactics of terror, American armed forces seek out Viet Cong guerrillas in an unconventional jungle war where control of the people is as vital as control of the land. The battle is here. The line is drawn here. Our commitments have been given here. But there's a civic action battlefield behind the lines, where a fight is being waged for the minds of men and their hearts. In a war that may be won through winning the people, demonstrating our steadfast, unselfish interest in defense of their freedom. The Americans didn't care about Vietnam. They didn't even know where it was. Almost no one could have found it on the map. They, we didn't care about it. But we did care about the notion we had that we were proud, macho, powerful Americans, that we were going to conquer everything, that we were the American empire, that nothing could stand in our way. We had the vanity of the Roman legions. And so we went into the wrong swamp. These events were, were very important to us. Vietnam was important. You know, we, uh, we were horrified by it, genuinely horrified. Americans are innocent to a degree. A lot of us just simply couldn't believe that our country, which we still believe was a very good country, could do something like that. And we were, that was, why the, that was why the new left could start new dialogues. Because people, f through many a spectrum of, of politics in America, were horrified by that war. And every year, more and more people were horrified. This is the nearest thing we've ever had to a spiritual revolution in America. Yeah, come on, all of you big strong men. Uncle Sam needs your help again. He's got himself in a terrible jam. Way down yonder in Vietnam. So put down your books and pick up a gun. I'm gonna have a whole lot of fun. And it's one, a two, a three. What are we fighting for? Don't ask me, I don't give a damn. Next stop is Vietnam. And it's five, six, I detest uh, political correctness. I, I think it's the enemy. I mean, there are many enemies, but they all come together under one rubric, which is one person is trying to tell another person how to think. Man, I ain't scared. I'll come to your house at 2 o'clock in the morning looking for you. I ain't scared of no battle. You're going to be a horse. It's going to take a good man to whoop me. You can look at me. I'm loaded with confidence. I can't leave me. I've had 180 amateur fights, 22 professional fights, and I'm pretty as a girl. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Muhammad Ali has just refused to be inducted into the United States Armed Forces. Notification of his refusal is being made to the United States Attorney, the State Director of the Selective Service System, and the local Selective Service Board for whatever action deemed to be appropriate. You know, he's an extraordinary fellow. Whenever, uh, you know, he, I don't think he can read to this day. He can read a word or two here or there. But he's one of the brightest people I've ever met. You know, and the brightness comes in his body movement as well as what he says. 
but there's a fine, high intelligence there. I don't think he thinks in terms of politics. I think he thinks in, I think his main feeling is, is that his people uh, have more freedom. He's a black man first. Uh, his great immortal, as far as I'm concerned, political contribution is what he said to America, you know, no Viet Cong ever called me nigger, which galvanized black people all over. Because they said, yeah, he's right, he's right. He said, no Viet Cong ever called me nigger. And within the year, he lost his championship. They took it away from him. He didn't lose it in the ring. Thousands of demonstrators opposed to the Vietnam War assembled in the nation's capital for a mass protest. For the most part orderly, minor scuffles did occur between the demonstrators and hecklers. Is he finally comic, a ludicrous figure with mock heroic associations, or is he not unheroic and therefore embedded somewhat tragically in the comic, or is he both at once and all at once? These questions, which probably are not much more answerable than the very ambiguities of the event, at least help us to recapture the precise feel of the ambiguity of the event and its monumental disproportions. Mailer is a figure of monumental disproportions, and so serves willy-nilly as the bridge, many will say the pons asinorum, into the crazy house, the crazy mansion of that historic moment when a mass of the citizenry, not much more than a mob, marched on a bastion which symbolized the military might of the Republic. What were you doing down there? I was trying to help the American Revolution. So why did the papers claim you were loaded? Uh, well, the papers, with their delicate sense of inaccuracy, were absolutely right when they said I was loaded. But I was loaded two days before the march. The day of the march, I was absolutely sober. Ah! I was drunk when I appeared in the theater. But I was drunk in my own way, which meant that I was highly sober and uh, more intelligent than usual. I, I used a great many uh, four-letter words. I read that. appearance in the theater. And I did it for a good reason. I wanted to make a point. Uh, the point I wanted to make is that we get terribly agitated about entertainers and authors being obscene in public. But we're engaged in a war which is so obscene that one minute in the life of General Westmoreland is more obscene than all the dirty words and all the dirty books that American authors have ever put together. Think about it, dear American people out there. Well, come on, brothers, throughout the land. Back your boys off to Vietnam. And it's one, two, three. What are we fighting for? Don't ask me, I don't give a damn. Next stop is Vietnam. And it's five, six, seven. Open up the 